turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. I've had this message on my heart for a long time, and, uh, and I finally get to, uh, to bring this, so I'm excited. I am excited. 2 Peter chapter 1. I, I can't even tell you how young I was when this scripture started blessing me because it's like, hmm, get excited. 2 Peter chapter 1, if you're there, verse 3 says, His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. By these, He has granted to us His precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. How many of you are saved this morning? Amen. Wave at me. All right. You've asked Jesus into your life. You've received him. Amen. And I'll tell you what. That means that this is for you. Because his divine powers has granted you already. Notice that's past tense. Granted you every, did you see everything in there? Everything that you need for life and godliness. I saw a, a more modern translation. I wanted to cross this out in their very poor translation of this. They, they said it, instead of for life and godliness, they said for a godly life. That's not the same thing. That's not the same thing. No, he wants to meet every need you have for life and for godliness, all right? He understands we live in a natural world. We have natural things to deal with. Anybody have a car, house? A pair of glasses, a pair of shoes. These things have to be attended to occasionally. Do they not? You know, when the little screw comes out of your glasses and then you have to run to the... Yeah, no. So, so I get, you know, we all get it. He gets it. You understand that. That's why he said, <clears throat> he didn't just say, he, his divine power is granted to us everything pertaining to godliness because then, you know, then you get all these high-minded spiritual, so-called spiritual people who are like, you know, touchy-feely, then God doesn't have anything to do with the natural. No, that's absolutely, absolutely, and 100% completely untrue. He understands exactly where we are and what we deal with, right? You understand that? Dr. Dave's here this morning. You know, do you ever see any sick people in the world? <laughs> yeah, he sees them every day. Do you understand this, though? See, see, see God not, isn't just in the business of dealing with spiritual things, right? He wants to deal with every natural situation that, that we have to deal with. And everybody has to deal with it. Amen? But, but notice here, again, we're going to read it one more time. His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him. It's through the knowledge of Him that we are able to get a hold of everything pertaining to life and godliness. We know that scripture, don't we? From Hosea, my people perish for lack of knowledge. They don't know what's going on. They don't know what God's offered. And they're not receiving because they don't know any better. I, I, I know people. My, my, uh, my dear aunt passed away last year. And not from COVID, but she passed away last year. And, and she walked in poor health most of her life because she, she loved the Lord with all of her heart, but she had no idea that God would heal. She had no idea how to walk in healing. So she, you know, she took her medications and did all the things the doctors told her to do, and she had a better life because of that, but she didn't have what she could have had because she didn't receive everything for life. She received everything she needed for godliness. You hear what I'm saying? But she didn't believe God for things for her life. You know, there, there's a, a, see, see, this is what people don't understand. They're like, well, if God wants me healed, he'll heal me. No, no. If God wants me filled with the Holy Spirit, he'll fill me. If he wants me saved, he'll save. No, no, no. See, people think that way because they think God's just going to move in and do whatever he wants to to you. And that isn't, that's not how he operates. He's a gentleman. Ask and you shall receive. Not, you're going to receive this no matter what, because this is what you need, and I'm going to give it to you, and I don't care whether you want it or not. Bam! You know, that, that, that isn't how he is. He's never going to be that way. Well, some people wish he were that way, but, but trust me, if it was really that way, you wouldn't want him that way, because uh, your life would, you would have all sorts of abrupt changes, and you'd be going, what happened? Why did this happen? But see, he's not that way. He's never going to be that way. 
But there's a man side and a God side to everything we have to deal with in this world. There's our part and his part. And if both of those don't happen, then it's not going to happen. I'm just going to say that. It's not going to happen. People say to me things like, you know, we just don't see God moving in our church much. Well, okay, there's a man side and a God side to that. And you know what? Let me ask you this. How many of you think God has messed up on his part? Yeah, see, you'd be pretty dumb to raise your hand at that moment because, <laughs> because it's like, no, I don't think. See, God has not messed up on his part. First Corinthians chapter 9, you don't have to look this up, says, God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. Another translation, I like this, it says, God never fails anyone. And he has called you into his son to be in fellowship with him and his son, and he's never, ever failed us. I'm going to read one more scripture to you. Deuteronomy 4.29 says, Seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all of your heart and all of your soul. And Jeremiah said the same thing. You'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Amen? You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm laying a, a groundwork here. I'm laying a foundation for what, what I feel like the Lord wants me to share today. So just bear, bear with me for a moment, okay? You know, First John... Chapter 5, they, they can put this verse up on the screen. 1 John chapter 5, I love this so much. This is verse 14 says, This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything, 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 according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked from him. We know that we have. Now, when I was growing up, my church, bless their hearts, you know, they, they, they questioned God's will on everything. You know, well, if you don't have food, it's because God didn't will it. That wasn't part of his will. That's ridiculous, okay? It's absolutely ridiculous. Anything that the word promises is for you. What does the word say? All the promises are what? Maybe and maybe, depending on you and your behavior that day. No, no, it doesn't say that. It says all the promises of God are yes and amen. All the promises of God are yes and amen for Elise, sitting right here, okay? They are yes and amen for Zach, sitting right here. They are yes and amen for Brandon and Will and Kat and Tiffany. They're yes and amen for every single one of us, amen? So, so don't just go, well... I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to get that. No, see, God's not the limiting factor here. How, how many of you know that Jesus is not the limiting factor here? That the Holy Spirit is not the limiting factor here? And, and I am the limiting factor here. And, and most of us avoid taking responsibility for things if we can possibly do it. When my wife says, you know, you did this, I'm like, yeah, but I, you did it. No, I would never do that to you. At least not in that tone of voice. Anyway, um, <laughs> um, We don't like taking responsibility for things. But the truth is, is that we know God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit did not drop the ball. So that brings us back to us. And, and we know James 4, 2, you have not because you ask not, right? We know that, right? Okay, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 says, Yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. A wisdom, however, not of this age or of the rulers of this age who are passing away, but we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. See, my people perish for lack of knowledge. He's trying to give us knowledge. Do you see this? But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. That's in this holy written word of God. The wisdom that none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory Verse 9, but as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard and which have not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Do you love him today? You know what? He's prepared things that you've never imagined. You've, in your wildest dreams, you've never hoped for. And, and some people put that off to heaven. They're like, well, that's going to happen in heaven someday. No, no, he, he wants to fill your life 
with things you never thought of, things you never dreamed of, things you never imagined as you come into knowledge of what you can have and what you can walk in. Verse 10, for, God, for to us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. Verse 12, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. Look at this. So that we may know the things freely given to us by God. The Holy Spirit's been given to us so that we may know what God has given us, what the possibilities are for our lives. And it says here that he's given those things freely to us. He's not closed-handed like we talked about a minute ago. He's not like this. He's like this. He's ready to give. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, you know, God's not just dangling a carrot out there in front of us, you know, somehow leading us on. No, no, there's a reality that we can walk in. Amen. You know, I, I grew up in church and we sang lots of hymns. And some of you know these hymns, but Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, lift me up to higher ground. That may not be quite the right words, but you know what? He has a higher place for you than you're walking in right now. He has a higher place for our church than we're walking in right now. And, and I'm just saying, I'm just saying, okay? You know, Paul, Paul said, I press on to the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. You know, you know he is going to call you upward. He's going to keep calling you upward forward. Is, is it, we're not going backwards. There's so many of us. I was the worst. None of you probably could have possibly kept up with me at how I look backwards at regrets and things that happened and, 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 and harmful and hurtful things that I experienced in my, in my childhood. You know, we, we, I, I, I think God was here and I was there. And when I first started, when I got filled with the Holy Spirit and the Lord started talking to me and, and he, would, I, he would talk to me about the future. And I'm like, Lord, you know, I'm dealing with this thing back here and, and I've got this going on and I feel really bad about myself and I feel, and he's like, and I'm, I'm, and he's talking about the future constantly. He would never talk about this stuff. He just constantly trying to lift me up. It's an upward call, guys. I'm sorry. You don't get to go backwards. You don't get to, and now, and I'm saying, now hear me. I'm not saying we don't ever have to deal with these things. Years and years and years later, he dealt with those things. OK, don't don't just don't get yourself so bogged down in the past that you can't even see what what God has for you. You know, he's got great things for you, but he's going to be constantly talking about that upward call. He's going to tr constantly keep you moving forward. He's going to constantly keep you trying to lift you up and and bring you into his will. But, you know, if you spend all of your time looking backwards, well, Okay, he's going to let you, by the way. He's going to let you do that, and he's going to let you spin your tires in the mud and make a big mess. Not because that's his will, but because you insist on doing it, and there's a man side and a God side to all of this, and if you, the man side isn't cooperating, or the woman side isn't cooperating, you understand what I'm saying, right? Human side isn't cooperating, then it ain't happening. Pastor Tony says it all the time. Our will trumps God's will. And people don't like that. They don't want to hear that. They want, no, God's sovereign. He's going to do it his way. No, he's not. He's going to do it your way. If you don't jump on board with him, I mean, he's just going. That train's moving. And if you don't jump on, you know, you're just going to be left. And I don't mean left. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, you know, he, you know, the train just keeps going by you. You might as well jump on and see where God's going telling you he's got great plans we just read that and all of them are freely given to us amen all right turn over to first corinthians chapter 12 first corinthians chapter 12 if you've been around church circles who teach the entire word of god then then you've heard something about the gifts of the spirit and at least i hope you have and today we're going to we're going to take some some foundational time and, uh, <clears throat> and take a look at this. But 1 Corinthians chapter 12 says this. Uh, let's see. Is it must be verse 1. 
Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. He does not want you to be unaware. Look at your neighbor and say, don't be unaware. <laughs> now, if you, will, if you have a Bible that italicizes words that are not actually in the Greek, you will see that that word gifts is italicized. So that's not there. It actually should read, concerning spiritual brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. Spiritual things would be a better translation. Uh, things of the spirit would be a better translation. But the word, they throw the word gifts in there just so that we understand. But he's actually just talking about you, about spiritual things. His divine power has given us all that we need for life and godliness. He's talking about the godliness part. Okay, he's talking about the walking with God part. <clears throat> but... Uh, you know, secondly, we just need to be aware here that Paul said, don't be unaware of these things. You need to know them. Hello. You need to know them. He's trying to tell them something they need to know. I don't want you to be unaware of this, guys. You need to know how this works, okay? <clears throat> Many of us have grown up or attended churches that believe the gifts or the things of the spirits died out with the original apostles. That's not possible. And, and, and I've had explained to me by, you know, some of the strongest, uh, you know, people who, who very strongly believe that was true, that the gifts were not available to us. And what they do is they, they'll take you over to 1 Corinthians 13, and then it, where it says, love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. And they go, see, they've been done away with. Yeah. Oh, Okay. Well, it says they will be done away with. That's future tense, isn't it? Isn't it? Future. They will be done. <clears throat> I will be going home later today and eating lunch. Okay? That's not now. I'm not leaving. I'm not going to walk out of here and go home and eat lunch yet. Okay? It's talking about the future. So we keep going here. Uh, they will cease if there is knowledge or it's actually the act of learn. Oh, no. I skipped one, didn't I? They will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. Uh, anybody here speak in tongues? Okay, anyway, we'll keep going. If there is knowledge, the act of learning, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. Now, he's obviously talking about two time frames here. Do you see that? Do you see that? Okay, let's, let's look at it. Now we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. Right? Two times. So they say, well, the, those two times are when the apostles were on earth and the perfect is God's, will, God's word, the holy written word of God, and therefore those things are gone. Well, well let's think about that. When the perfect comes, does this tell us everything there is to know about God? No, I don't think so. I think, was it John who wrote, if, if I were to write down everything he did, it would fill the whole world with, his, with the books. Amen. So that can't be. Can this be perfect, meaning complete, and tell us everything there could ever be to know about God? No, I think we're going to spend eternity figuring out and learning about God. So that, but, but let's just keep reading here, okay? Then he goes, when I was a child, one time frame, I used to speak like a child and think like a child and reason like a child. But when I became a man, I did away with childish things two times. But now we see in a mirror dimly. But then, now look, then face to face. Ray, do you see Jesus face to face? Right now. Do you see him? Face to face. Live. No. So, so he's talking about heaven, right? Talking about when Jesus returns after the church age, right? So, so, so understand the two time frames are now where we see dimly, we don't know everything. And then when we shall see face to face, are you going to need to speak in tongues when Jesus is here and you're face to face? And, and you, it says here, look at what it says. Look at the finish of verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part... But then, when it we're face to face, I will know fully, just as I have been fully known. See, we're going to know everything. Are we going to need prophecy? No, because we're going to know everything. Are we going to need tongues? No, we won't need that. We're not going to need any of those things then. But now, Paul said, I don't want you to be unaware. I want you to be aware of what you need right now for 
your life and godliness. Amen. So, if we're going to interpret this properly, we've got to understand that then and now are now where we're here on earth and don't see him face to face. And then when we do see him face to face, it says we're going to know all things just as he knows us fully now. He knows us fully now. Aren't you glad? Amen. I'll tell you what. He'll pinpoint things that you need to work on or help you understand something about yourself that you never understood because he sees it all. He gets it. He just knows you're not quite ready for that until you're ready, and then he'll tell you. Amen? All right, so we're still in, uh, we're still in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Skip to verse 4. All right? Now, there are varieties of gifts or workings of the Holy Spirit or things of the Spirit, or things that are spiritual things, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, we know that, and the same Lord, there are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in how many? All persons. He works all things in all persons, but to each one, look at your neighbor and say, each one, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You know, I, 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 I was talking along these lines one day, and somebody came up to me afterwards, and they're like, God doesn't do anything in me. He doesn't move in me. I'm like, well, you better get saved. <laughs> no, I didn't actually say that. But, <laughs> but that's what I would say, because, because you know what? It, it says right there, this is God speaking, to each one is given the manifestation for the common good, right? But, but he said, didn't he say... All things and all persons, and to each one is given. Okay. Point at yourself and say, he's talking to me. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith, the gift of faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing. It's actually plural, gifts of healings, plural, uh, by the same Spirit, by the one Spirit, to another the effecting of miracles, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another, and that's not talking, it's talking about in the church here, not your gift of tongues or your prayer language. He's talking about where you stand up and speak in tongues and somebody interprets it, right? And to another the interpretation of tongues. But the one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to who? each one individually just as he wills. For even as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so is Christ. Verse 13. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Amen? Amen. Verse 18. But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. We're going to keep going here. Skip down to verse 27. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church. Here we talk about more appointings, more giftings. First apostles, second prophets, and third teachers. Miracles, gifts of healings, helps, administrations. Did you know that helping was a gift of the Spirit and anointed by Him? I could name some people around here. Miss Venice, Miss Sharon. I'm not trying to miss anybody, but you understand, you know, some, some, some people don't understand that, that God anoints and gives these things. Verse 29, all are not apostles, are they? Well, are they? No, certainly not. All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak in tongues, that's the tongues in the church, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts. Turn over to Galatians chapter 3. You know, we are so passive sometimes. And, you know, back in the early church, the immature church, um, there, there, <clears throat> there wasn't... Okay, they were all just new Christians, right? There wasn't anybody yet who was ready to be a pastor or a teacher. So, you know, the apostle came in, started the church, and now they've got a bunch of spiritual babies there, right? And, and so, so 
so God, you know, we, we, we look at that. We look at some of those passages in Acts, and, it, and I, when I was young and ignorant and in college, I thought, you know, that's the kind of church we need. We just all need to come together, and each one has this, and each one has that, and, and we just have a church service where we have, you know, everybody and their dog talking, and, uh, and, and, and that sound, that worked really, really well for them because they didn't have a pastor yet, all right? But, but you know, it, it, does it mean, though, that we don't need those things today? A lot of people just passively sit back and go, yeah, well, you know, <clears throat> I can tell you the first time God moved on me, to, to share something that he told me about them, I didn't do it because I was just like, uh, who am I? Okay, here we go again. I'm looking backwards instead of looking at him. Didn't you enjoy Emily? Just him. Just you. You know, if we just keep our eyes on him and just follow him, we, we wouldn't do all that. We, but we overthink it. And, oh, I don't know. They might not like that. I don't know if that's really God. I mean, okay, we can just, can we not, hello? Can we not go on all day like that? Sure we can. And, and all these gifts, it says he's given somebody, everybody something. Well, yeah, but I, don't, I want the flashy gift. Well, he said, earnestly des desire the greater gifts. Although with that attitude, I can tell you that's not quite how you get that. But, 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 but hear me, he, he, are we supposed to just sit back in church and, you know, is that what we're supposed to do? Well, okay, I, I don't think so. Did I tell you Galatians 3? Okay, look at this. Look at this, guys. Verse 2, we'll start there. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit? These guys, okay, let me give you a little history before we do this. These guys were trying to please God by their works. Okay, do you understand that gifts of the Spirit are by the Spirit, and it isn't you? And, and you know, what do you have that you didn't get from Him? You know, nothing. So, you know, there's no pride there. You understand that. In fact, a true prophet's going to be really, really humble because they realize this isn't for me, and I sure don't want to miss it when I tell this person what God told me to tell them. You know what I'm saying? But these guys in Galatia, they were trying to, they were trying to earn God's favor by works, and there were some other things going on, but we'll just suffice it to say that. Number two, uh, verse 2, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Well, which is it? Hearing with faith. Better, Ben, right? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Well, no. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Look at verse 5. It's so important. So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and work miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Wait a minute, Pastor Dave. Gifts of working of miracles... Working in miracles is not something I can just do. I can't just go around working miracles. So, so and, and, and even if I have faith, it's a move of the Spirit. So I don't understand how, what, what does that mean? I've actually, heard, I've actually heard from the pulpit that somebody said that basically did not mean what it says. How many of you think God probably meant what he said? Okay, let's read that again, shall we? All right, verse 5. So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you, do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith. So, how many of you here? How many of you have faith? Why aren't we seeing miracles? People ask me this. Why aren't we seeing miracles? Mm -hmm. Hang with me a minute. You know, Brother, Brother Hagen was in a meeting one day, and I, I tell this because I haven't had this happen to, with me. So I tell, I'll tell you about him, all right? He, he had a meeting big meeting, there were three women in wheelchairs sitting right in front of him. And as I recall, the story went something like this. In the middle of the meeting, the Lord spoke to him and said, you tell, there's three people, you tell that one to get up out of that chair. She hadn't been out of her chair in like 10 years. And she jumped out of her chair and ran around the place like she was a child. Amen. You know, and then you got the people, well, what about those two? Well, the Lord didn't say anything to her, to him about them. Could they have received healing from the Lord? Absolutely. Could they have put their faith out there and received it? No, absolutely. Because we, we just read that in 1 John 5. If you ask anything according to his will, is it his will that you be healed? Yeah. 
then he hears you. And if he hears you, you know you have what you ask. Does it not say that? But I don't know. I don't know what the difference was. I don't know what. I don't know. I don't, I don't care. It's so exciting. God did this amazing miracle. Up she jumped. Brother Hagin said, now, if I could have pulled that same lever and pushed that same button for the other two people sitting there, I would have done it. Hello. You still with me? If you could pull the same lever and push the same button to get them all, wouldn't you do it? Yeah, but, but see, see there, there's a God side and a man side to this, okay? There's a God side and a man side to this. And, you know, I don't know why God does what he does. All I know is that the healing was available to all of them. All three of them could have been healed, but supernaturally in the spirit, God moved with one person, okay? Why would he do that? Because he's God, he knows the heart, he knows the situation, he knows where everybody's at, all right? You think he's not smart? You think he's mean? He's not mean. He's love. He's constant love, all right? But, but, but you know what? I, I, uh, I, I, heard, I heard a story about somebody, and, and you know, they, they went to a meeting, and they received their healing, and, and they were better, but then the enemy starts dinging with their head, and, and pretty soon... They started feeling, oh, again, you know, oh, oh. And then a week later, they were back to where they started. Was that God's will? No. But see, see, there's a man side and a God side to all of this, okay? There's a man side and a God side to all of this. Well, I, I had somebody tell me, well, if God did it, it would have lasted. Mm, really? I, I, I hate to tell you this, but, but I'll, you know what? You have to hold on, Okay. And, you know, and, and I could, we could line up a bunch of scriptures on that. But let me, let me just let me keep going here, and then, and then you'll take hold of some of this, all right? But, you know, with, with, with this, okay, with this situation, you know, some people would look at it and go, well, yeah, but you never know what God's going to do. Is that true? No, his word's full of things that he's going to do. There's, his word is full of things he wants to do, he wants to accomplish, okay? And, and, and uh, you know, Psalm 119, verse 89 says, Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Do you understand that? what that means? It's not going to change. It's not going to change today. It's not going to change tomorrow. It, it didn't change a thousand years ago. And 20 million billion years from now, it's still going to be true. His word is forever settled. He isn't going to change his mind. He's not going to do that. So, there are three keys I want to talk about to unlocking the supernatural in our lives, all right? There are three keys that I think we need to know, and I'm keeping my eye on the clock, all right? All right. <clears throat> Verse, okay, turn to Romans chapter 12. Brother Hagen used to call healing the, the, the calling card of God. You know, in his meetings, he said this. Now, think about this, because this relates directly to this, because it bothers us, doesn't it? Doesn't it bother us? One person got healed, one person didn't. Why does it? That bothers us. We're like, you know, we're, we're, we're taught every, you know, from the, even a, a five-year-old knows everything should be fair. That doesn't seem fair. But Brother Hagin said this. He said, in, in my meetings, rarely, if ever, did I see a born-again, spirit-filled Christian get healed. The people who got healed supernaturally by the Holy Spirit were unsaved people and people who grew up without any teaching about healing or about God's power. They just grew up in some, you know, kind of cold denominational church. They didn't know anything about it. We were like, well, yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? All right. You know what? If you're born again, spirit filled, if you're born again in spirit filled, you have God's word. You have teaching, hopefully, in your church. If you don't, you should go find one that teaches the Word. Amen? And, and, and that is all available to you all the time. You remember the prodigal son, the story? Right. The older brother? The, the son took half of his father's possessions and left, squandered it all on wild living and prostitutes. And when his money was gone... He was, found himself working on a farm, taking care of pigs. And he thought, you know, my father's servants have a better life than me. 
I'm going to go back and see if daddy will take me back as a servant. I know I've squandered the son thing, but he'll see if he'll take me back as a servant. So he went back home. And, and the Bible tells us that the father saw him coming and ran to him and put the robe on him and the ring on him and reinstated him as his son and, and threw a big party. And the older brother heard the party out in the fields. And he's like, what's going on? And they said, your brother came back. And he was m angry. And, and he said to his father went out to get him and he wouldn't come in. And he said, he said, dad, you know, I, I've worked my tail off for you all these years and you've never given me a thing. And the father looked at him and he said, everything I have is yours. Always has been. Always will be. See, that's God. Everything I have is yours. Healing 100% available to these two born-again, spirit-filled people. This unsaved person, you're not, but you understand what I'm saying. Uh, you know, this unsaved person over here. They don't know a thing about God, and they needed a massive supernatural moment to wake them up and get them on the right track. You know, these two people just need to trust God. Now, are they going to do that? Well, that's up to them. Are they going to believe the word or not believe the word? Are they going to act on the word or not act on the word? I mean, you know, we don't want to put that on us. We want to throw it off on God and say God's not fair. Oh, come on. We know he's fair. We just don't have the knowledge to understand the reasons and what God's up to. Did I tell you Romans 12? Yeah. Thought I did. All right. So, so we're gonna, this is kind of a follow-up to what we just read in Galatians. Verse 4, For just as we have many members in one body, and the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Now you see that we're part of the body. The, the arm and the foot do not have the same function. You understand that, right? The nose and, and the little finger do not have the same function. We all have a different role to play. But we all have a role to play. Some of us just haven't done that role, okay? You know, my dad had a stroke in 2005, and his left arm wasn't working much anymore, okay? We, we have some people who, who are not working much anymore, Okay, and I'm not saying you should do more than what God's called you to do, but I'm saying that you should do what God has called you to do, but I better keep going here. All right, where were we? Verse 6, since we have gifts that differ, we're all different, according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. You still reading with me? If prophecy, you don't have any control over that, so don't do anything, just wait and see if God moves. Is that what it says? Yeah, that is clearly not what it says. If prophecy, according to the proportion of your faith. Did you see that? Now, wait a minute. Prophecy only comes from the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit has to move on you and, and has to give you something to say, and we don't just go do that. No, but you know what? Without an atmosphere of faith, he can't move. You understand that? Without atmosphere of faith, he can't do anything. So, so the gift of prophecy operates according to the proportion of your faith, what about the gifts of healings? Yeah, it'd be the same, wouldn't it? What about the gift of miracles? It would be the same. That's what Paul was saying to him in Galatians. He was like, you know, does it come by faith or does it come by the works of the law? No, 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 no. It comes by faith. That's the first key to unlocking the, spiritual, the supernatural is us having faith. Amen. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. But it can also be translated that faith gives substance to things hoped for. Do we all, do we all hope for the moving of God in our services? Do we all hope for miracles in our services? Do we all hope for supernatural healings in our services? Amen. I would love to see that happen every single time we walk in this building. And write this down. In an atmosphere of faith, all things are possible. In an atmosphere of faith, all things are possible. Jesus said in Matthew, uh, with God, all things are possible. Did you understand the word all is in there? All right. And, and we look at it and go, yeah, but I'm not I'm not walking in that. I'm not walking where I need to be. Things aren't going right for me 100 percent. You know what? All things are possible. 
All things are possible. You can walk in those things that you're not walking in right now. And God wants you to. He's excited about it. He can't wait till you do it. Amen? You know, and, and let's just take a quick look at the woman with the issue of blood. You can turn there if you want, Mark chapter 5. But I'm going to uh, just read this. Now, a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years. She had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better and rather grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said to herself, or she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Now, did Jesus initiate this miracle? No, she did. And in, in a second, in the, in the next couple of verses, Jesus said, your faith has made you well. So, so when I tell you that God moves in an atmosphere of faith, you understand that, that who initiates that bringing of faith in and that atmosphere of faith? We do. Now, the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that faith is not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. He's given us the measure of faith, but you know, we bring that measure of faith with us. All right. And uh, it's like we're having a food drive and we have a box out there and everybody shows up with a can. The box doesn't fill itself. We all bring a measure in. OK. And, and so she brought her measure of faith to Jesus and said, when I touch his garments, I'm going to be healed. She brought her faith and Jesus said to her, your faith has made you well. Now, was it just her faith that made her well? No, because there's a God side and a man side. Power of God was there to heal. He felt power go out from him, but he didn't even initiate it. It wasn't even his idea. He wasn't even planning to do it. He was on his way to Jairus' house, and she took hold of him with her measure of faith, and boom, a miracle happened. You see that? See, see, we have to come with our measure of faith. Well, you know, if we want to sit back and go, well, you know, God just doesn't move in our services like I wish he would, really. Well... Did you bring your measure of faith today? I don't know. All right. Key number two is expectation. You know, the opposite of expectation is, is doubt and unbelief. <coughs> Excuse me. When, when Jesus went to his hometown and spoke in the temple, the people uh, looked at him and go, you know, who does he think he is? Isn't this the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon are not his sisters here with us. And they took offense at him because they knew him. And who does he think he is coming in here? And who does he think he is running around the countryside, supposedly doing miracles and all this? And, and the word says that Jesus could do no miracle there, no mighty thing there. And, <coughs> and I, I was hunting around online this week, and I found a passage, you know, well, does it really mean he couldn't or he didn't want to? Well, you, okay, just be ignorant if you want to. No, no, you just, you know, was it let the ignorant be ignorant still? Isn't that a, an old saying, right? Um, you know, no, 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 he could there. That means exactly what it says, because there was no atmosphere of faith there. They didn't bring their, por their you know, their portion of faith with them. They didn't bring it. No, 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 no. They brought their, who does he think he is? Let's see what he's going to do. Well, guess what? Who does he think he is? Let's see what he's going to do. Is not a big receiver. Do you understand that? And they got just exactly. Now, apparently a few people believed that maybe he could do something because it says he cured what, what it says in the Greek is he cured a few mild, mild ailments that day. And that was as much as happened because who does he think he is? All right. That is the opposite of expectation. Okay. Turn over to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. I love this. This cracks me up almost. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. Now this is, guys, this is what expectation looks like. Okay, so you ready for this? Acts chapter 5, verse 12. 
At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's portico. I think that's part of the temple. But none of the rest dared to associate with them. However, the people held them in high esteem. And all the more believers in the Lord, multitudes of men and women, were constantly added to their number, to such an extent that they even carried the sick out to the streets and laid them on cots and pallets, so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on them. Also, the people from the cities in the vicinity of Jerusalem were coming together, bringing people who were sick or afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all being healed. Now that is expectation. I'm going to go lay, I'm going to bring my, you know, sick uncle and lay him down on the street. And maybe, let's see, it's going to be five o'clock when Peter walks by. The shadow is going to go this way. <laughs> I'm laying him right there. That is expectation, people. Uh, all right, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Let's look at another verse here. Expectation for us. We're going to talk about us for a minute, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Is that what I told you? This is a passage talking about orderly church services. Verse 23, just so you understand what, what, that's what it's talking about. Verse 23 says, Therefore, if the church assembles together... Okay, you see that? So are we assembled together? Yes, okay. Verse 26, What is the outcome then, brethren? Um, <laughs> Do you see if, does it show up there? It doesn't show there. In my Bible, the word the outcome isn't there because it's not in the Greek. So, so in other words, Paul's going, so what's up? What's, gonna, what's going on here? What is? <laughs> what is going to happen? What, the, what is then, guys, when you're together? What's going to happen? All right. When you assemble, each one has a Bible, a notebook, and a pen. <laughs> oh, no, it didn't say that. But you know what? We have people who show up with a Bible and notebook and pen, and that's it. Either say amen or oh me, okay? Um, no, 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 it doesn't say that. It says each one has a psalm, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Do you see that? You see that? The, the, the word, you know, and, I, and, I, and I, I'm not going to get to it. I'm going to run out of time. But there's, a, there's another verse that I was looking at that says, you know, we should all be showing up at church ready to encourage somebody else. You know, there's going to be days that you come here and you need encouragement. Okay? But all the other days, you come here ready to encourage somebody else. Don't just bring your notebook and your pen. Hello. Don't get mad at me now just because I'm saying what you need to hear. All right? Just, just, just deal with it. All right? First Peter chapter 4. Let's run over there for a half a second. You know, this is, I'm running out of time here fast. That's not good. All right, First Peter chapter 4, verse 10. As each one has received a special gift, special is not there, but we are special in God's eyes. I mean, each one of us received a manifestation of the Spirit. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. <laughs> Years ago, my parents were going to a Baptist church when I was in college, and I'd come home, and, and my dad was the church treasurer, and he... Uh, he uh, he would always clown around. He'd, he'd always get up and go, okay, today, you know, I'm the church treasurer. I have a few important figures I'm going to tell you. And he'd go, $365.32, $28.52. You know, he's not telling him. You know, just, he just clowning around, giving him numbers that mean nothing. And, and, he, and he goes, he, he was clowning around about the word stewardship. And he, he said, it's just a Baptist word for money. And, uh, and about the next person, the next person who got up and spoke, it was at the annual meeting and he's presenting, you know, whatever. And, and in the whole con they did the whole congregation was there, right? So the next guy who gets up just glaring at my dad, I mean, like if looks could kill, 
So he's like, the ushers have a brochure that they're going to be passing around as we move into our building program. And right on the front of it, it said stewardship. <laughs> <laughs> It's the Baptist word for money. No, no offense to any <laughs> Baptists who may be watching. I grew up Baptist, kind of, so you know, we get it. Anyway, um, but but that isn't what, it isn't a Baptist word. For, stewardship does not mean money. You understand that? As each one has received a special gift, employ it with serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Okay. A good steward is somebody who takes good care of something. If I give my, my, my wife my glasses and ask her to take care of those, she's not going to throw them on the floor and, or throw them in the mud or, you know, throw them in the trunk, which is like the black hole of Calcutta. You know, she's, she's not going to do that. If she's going to be a good steward of my glasses, she's going to take care of them, make sure they're in a safe place and not dirty. Do you understand that? So if we're going to be good stewards of the gifts that God has given us, that means we have to put them to work, right? We have to figure out how he wants us to use them. And when he's ready, it's a God side, man side. When he's ready, we're ready. You get that part? All right. An atmosphere of faith and an atmosphere of expectation is what, is what we need to get to the place where God can do that. All right, the last point I'm going to make, and, and I'm skipping way ahead here. Uh, turn over, if you want to, to John chapter 2, the, the wedding at Cana. And the first verse of John chapter 2, the Gospel of John chapter 2 says this. On the third day, when there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus, Jesus hadn't even started his ministry yet, really. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, <laughs> I love this, they have no more wine. You know, I walk up to Zach, Zach, we have no more wine. Zach's like, and what am I supposed to do about that? I think it's hilarious. It's, it's a very much of a mom thing for you moms out there. We thank you for doing mom things, all right? They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not come. Did she back down? No. No, she didn't. She went over to the servants and said this. Whatever he says, do it. Now, see, that's point number three on, on inviting the supernatural into our services. Faith, expectation, and whatever he says, do it. Okay, so, so the servants are out of wine, and they're waiting for, you know, she goes, okay, or they're, they're out of wine, and, and they're expecting, okay, go down to so-and-so's house, he's got an abundance, they were expecting that, and what they got was, there's some water pots over there, go fill those up. Well, that's A, ridiculous, and B, not the answer to the problem, at least in their minds. Am I right? So what did they do? Well, Mary said, she, apparently she had some authority there. Whatever he says, do it. So they were like, well, we'll go do it then. But this is dumb. So they filled the water pots full. And then Jesus dips them out and put it in a cup and said, here, take this to the headmaster and have him check it out. <laughs> you mad? Would you want to be that servant? You're like, <laughs> okay, that guy over there just told me to give this to you to taste. Although, it probably changed color while he was walking. And be like, okay, something's happening here. And the headmaster went to, the, to the, the, the bridegroom, the groom, and said, okay, usually they serve the best wine first, and then the poor wine later after people have had plenty to drink, but you have saved the best on now. See, Jesus doesn't even make bad wine. You see that? So, uh, but the point is, is whatever he says, do it, guys. You know what? in an atmosphere of faith where we come in with expectation, ready to be a blessing and to be good stewards of our gifts. And whatever he says, do it, just do it. Don't overthink it. Don't be like me. In my youth, when I overthought everything, I still overthink some things, but uh, I try not to overthink everything anymore. Amen? All right. I'm going to one more verse, and then I'm going to... to, uh, to let you go. Amen. All right. Matthew chapter 25. I'm 
this is a very long passage. All right, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Now when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, those who are servants of him, who are followers of him, who have received him versus those who have refused him, rejected him, etc. Right? And Verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry? or feed you, or thirsty, or give you something to drink? And when, when did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or naked and clothe you, and, and sick and in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to the one of my brothers, or the least of my brothers, even the least of them, you did it to me. You know, as you come armed and dangerous to church, <laughs> I'm not talking about a gun, I'm talking about armed with faith, and armed as a good steward of whatever gift God has given you, whatever encouraging word you have, you know what? You're going to start being a blessing to people and not a liability to the church. Amen? You know, I heard somebody say this once, that, we, that there was, our church can't grow because our spiritual nursery is full. You know what? Let's all just grow up and stop being, you know, passive and sitting out here with our books and our pens and going, okay, you know, we'll let somebody else do it. Uh, and you know what? Because, because here's the deal. There's great reward. And whatever we do for somebody else, God says, you did it to me. Amen. And it goes on to say to those who, on his other side, he's, you know, it, it, it says just the opposite, right? When I was in prison, you didn't visit me. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was naked, you didn't clothe me. And they were like, when did we see you? When did we see you? And he said, if you didn't do it for the least of these, you didn't do it for me. Depart from me. You know, he, you know, the, the, the word says, store up treasure in heaven. Do you understand that, that the word says if we give a cup of cold water in his name, that we'll get rewarded for that. The slightest, littlest thing we do to bless somebody else, he rewards us. When we come armed with faith to our church services, fully expecting God to move, you know, we're going to see God move more and more. As the time approaches, the word says so. We're going to see more and more and more of what God's doing in this world, but he's going to, he's going to start in our body. And then we're going to be able to reach out to other people. You know, I'll tell you, close with this story. My cousin, um, they, their little boy died. Um, he was diagnosed with neuroblastoma cancer when he was two, and he died at about age five. And, uh, and laying on his, make me cry, laying on his bed singing songs about heaven. But, but my cousin walked away from that going, I got to know God better. And she learned that God was a healer and that God was the restorer and that God could have healed her son. But you know what? Not worried about that. She and her husband owned a sandwich shop, like a Subway type store. And, uh, and everybody come in, how you doing today? Oh, I'm sick. Really? Can I pray for you? <laughs> Having a really tough day. Really? Well, can I help you? Can I pray for you? You know, God will help you. He'll help you. He'll encourage you. I mean, everybody who walked in that place, you better watch out. <laughs> you better watch out. She got tons of people saved and healed and say, you know, and, and, and blessed so many people. Today, she works for a national ministry on the prayer line, answering prayer calls. And when they come in, she's like, yes, I can pray for you. Because she found out that faith and expectation and whatever he says, do it works. And, and you know what? It does work. It says so right here. And we, we're the ones who make it work. So come to church with your faith. Come to church ready to encourage somebody and to bless somebody and be ready. And, and don't forget your notebook and your pen. You better bring those too, okay? All right. All right, let's pray. Father, we